or me. My name's Todd Rowe, which kind of leads into my introduction a little bit here this morning. So once again, my name is Todd Rowe. I am an attorney at Tressler LLP here in Chicago, and we are going to address some of our concerns this morning with SOPA which is the Student Online Personal Protection Act. Uh, just a really quick little background on me. Uh, I have been a privacy attorney now for about 10 years or so. And so we have been working on a lot of different issues internationally, nationally, and here in Illinois. Uh, Illinois is an interesting state to practice privacy in because we have so many different statutory frameworks, such as the Personal Information Protection Act, and of course we have BIPA, so if you have any questions related to those, uh, we'd be more than happy to assist with that. But today we're going to focus on SOPA. Uh, like I said, that's uh, short for the Student Online Personal Protection Act. Uh, just in case anybody wants to look up the statute as we go along, is 105 ILCS 85, which for non-lawyers out there, you can essentially Google that and that will bring up the Illinois statute, which it lays it out pretty nicely too. And that's what we're going to be focusing on today. Uh, SOPA is one of the main reasons I think it's becoming such a growing concern is the legislative intent that we see. So if you were to look at the statute, the legislature, the Illinois legislature, when they were creating SOPA, uh, laid out exactly the reason for it. And the big reasons I think would be sort of the more general reasons would just be to protect student data. Uh, that's, you know, juvenile data, minors data. And, you know, broadly, one of the reasons why that is so important to make sure that that data is protected is because people can do really bad things with children's data and they can go and get mortgages or lots of different things. And there's a good chance that if it's a child, they're not gonna know that that damage has been done until they get to the age of 18 or so when they're going to get mortgages for themselves or student loans or something along those lines or other type of financing. And then there's been years and years where there's been use of their information. So that's the importance behind student data. And that's one of the reasons of why we see the Illinois legislature really step up and try to protect it. And I think one of the other thoughts behind the legislature's actions here is because of the way education is going and the corporations that are getting involved in uh, the uh, in, in, in education and how those corporations are using the data of students. So I have to say that right now, Illinois is leading the way on SOPA and protecting student data. So it's a really a unique way, place to practice law and it's a unique place probably for a lot of educators at this time. So we're gonna get into it. One of the important things I think with the legislative intent behind it is we have that here on this slide. It's to put in sufficient safeguards uh, to protect privacy and security and data about students when it's collected by educational technology companies. Now that's gonna be the phrase that I use a lot today, ed tech, that's kind of, uh, you know, who is the target of this? And those companies can be everything from Pearson to ACT and SAT. So when we talk about ed tech, this is really what we're talking about is how ed tech is using this information that belongs to the students. Um, so let's move along here. So how did the Illinois, Illinois legislature know to be worried about educational technology, not educational technology companies while drafting SOPA? Um, so SOPA has been around for a couple of years as far as you know the drafts of the legislation. But one of the main reasons I think that makes so why it makes it clear that SOPA is so useful is what we saw this this summer when Pearson, who is an ed tech company. Uh, had a breach and there was a September 6th, 2019 uh, Chicago Tribune article which talks about this breach and the ensuing lawsuit from that breach. And I think if you look at this, this lawsuit and this article, you really get a feel for what is trying to be protected and what this looks like when an ed tech company has access to this much data and doesn't perhaps protect it as well as it should and you see a breach and you see a lot of students uh, data involved in that breach. So if you look, Pearson is a British owned company who handles a lot of student data. And what we're talking about when, you know, 
as far as with how the student debt is being used, if you have a child in school, or if you, of course, are an administrator in a school, you know how this data is being used now for everything from grades, um, making sure kids are going to school, making sure they're in the right places when they arrive at the school, inside the school, uh, grades, everything. Uh, that's student data, and that is how it's being used, and it makes our jobs easier as, as administrators in schools, but it's also a lot of information to be giving to a third party. So the Pearson breach really illustrates what happened there, and there's the lawsuit uh, alleges that the, that Pearson had access to last names, dates of birth, email addresses, and unique student ID numbers, and they breached that information. And you can just really see the problems if you're a school district or a school, and you entrust this information to Pearson, and then they go and breach it, and then you, you don't have control. And then you have questions as far as how responsive will Pearson be uh, to your questions about the breach, or what happened to the data? And then also you have the other problem as far as parents aren't going to look to Pearson because they may not know that Pearson was entrusted with that information. They're going to look to the school and they're going to want to know and you better be ready to answer the questions. So compliance with SOPA would solve a lot of problems that we saw with the Pearson breach. I looked at Pearson's privacy statement just to see what they were doing uh, since this lawsuit was filed. And Pearson just says that they comply with FERPA which is the Family Education Rights Act and COPA, which is the child, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. But it really didn't mention anything about SOPA. So once again, I apologize for all the acronyms here, but that's kind of how this area of the law has developed. So a good place to look to see really what the problem is, is that September 6, 2019 Chicago Tribune article. So what's going on with ed tech? Uh, we see generally what's just referred to as the Googleization of the classroom. Uh, and that's really what's going on. It, the data is being entrusted to these companies because it makes our lives easier. Uh, so when that data, once again, it can't be stressed enough, is entrusted, that's when we start to have some of the problems. So let's get into a, a little bit what EdTech is doing and how they fell into the crosshairs of this legislation. We, there's a really interesting article that I found, and it's not something that I typically would read, but it's Teen Vogue, and I gave the link here on this slide. Teen Vogue did an article about education technology, and there was just a lot of information there that really forms a good foundation for getting caught up on SOPA, SOPA and getting SOPA compliant. But we see, uh, you know, that article reports that 90 million users worldwide uh, have information that's being used by EdTech. So these 90 million users, of course, are students, minors. And we're talking, when we talk about the age gap difference, we're talking everything from kindergarten, essentially, all the way to the 12th grade. Once again, really quick, SOPA does not apply to colleges. So that's something that we should really consider as well. We're talking about K through 12. So... And, and interesting, uh, when you pull up the article the, in Teen Vogue, uh, which it actually is a really good article, but it talks a lot about College Board, which is the, the um, they call themselves a not-for-profit entity, and they administer the, the, S, the SAT, the PSAT, and other AP tests, advanced placement tests, and just how much money they're making using this data and licensing the data. Uh, at this point, it says College Board ranked in nearly raked in nearly 100 million in overall revenue. So that's one of the issues that we're seeing with EdTech is there's a lot of money to be made with that. Another interesting thing that I wanted to make sure everybody's referred to it's an FBI warning uh, that came out in uh, on September 13, 2018. Just if you wanted to Google that, it's alert number I-091318-PSA, and it's entitled Education Technologies, Data Collection, and Unsecured Systems Could Pose Risks to Students. That's a really good bulletin, I think, for a lot of school administrators to take a look at. It's the FBI sort of uh, looking at what this problem is with ed tech. It also gives a good definition, I think, of the information that ed tech is gathering from schools and it allows schools to look at what they're providing. And that information includes, as far as the, the FBI bulletin is concerned, 
uh, PII, which is personally identifiable information. That's information that identifies the student, gives information such as name, address. If somebody was able to obtain that information, could they create a profile on who that child is, who that student is? Biometric data, of course, that's data that it relates to the body. Um, so that's going to be falling into this and needs the protection before it's sent over to uh, any other third party vendor. And, you know, we think, you know, biometric data it has such an advanced sounding name, but really that technology is getting everywhere into our workplaces and our schools. Thumb scanning for entering time, uh, you know, for workers, things along that, that. So we're seeing biometric data really come into a lot of different places. Uh, information related to academic process, progress would be protected. Behavioral, disciplinary, and medical information, of course. Uh, web browsing history. Students geolocation, geo that's where they are within the school once they get there. IP addresses used by students and classroom activities. You know, and another thing to, to really be thinking about too is yeah, students using Google Chromebooks or other personal devices issued by the school and what they're doing with those emails and the use of those devices. So that's gonna be another thing that we need to watch and protect. So let's talk a little bit about what is protected by SOPA. And that's what's referred to in the statute as covered information. And covered information looks a lot like that FBI bulletin that was put out. Covered information will be personally identifiable information or material or information that's linked to personally identifiable information or material. So once again, you know, the simple way to say that is, it's just information that you can use to identify that student. Once again, we're talking about biometric data, academic progress, things along those lines. And the next definition that I think that we need to at least have before we get into sort of this uh, high level view of SOPA is what a school is. And a school is very broad. It's any preschool, public kindergarten, elementary, or secondary education institution, vocational or secondary education, educational agency or institution. Uh, it does include private and non-public schools, but as we're gonna see down the road here, there's different regulations for both private and non-public schools. So that's gonna really, when you start to look at how you need to comply with SOPA, whether you're a private institution or a non-public, or a private or a public institution is really gonna tell you a lot about where you should be going with this. Let's talk a little bit more about SOPA structure, and I, I could talk for hours about SOPA, but I'm trying to keep it light and just give everybody at least, you know, a, a feeling of what SOPA, the obligations that SOPA creates. But it's really broken up into, and this is how I view it, it's broken up into operator prohibitions. Now, the term operator is really the ed tech companies that we're talking about, those, those uh, companies that have the data and they have their own obligations under SOPA. And I don't think we're gonna have the time today to talk about what those obligations are on operators. We're gonna focus more on um, the obligations for schools, but it is important to look at the obligations on operators because schools have a lot of requirements that, that make the, the operators, the people that they entrust the data with, they need to make sure those operators are in compliance. So you can't just simply bury your head in the sand about what the ed tech companies are doing. You have to really take a close look at what they're doing. Uh, there's also, the statute is broken up into school prohibitions, state board duties, which we're not gonna really have a chance to look at today, but it's definitely something that is relevant. And then parent and student rights, which I do wanna take a closer look at because once again, when parents and students have rights, those put obligations on the schools to make sure that the schools have a protocol or some process in place to make sure that those parents and students can exercise those rights. So this is the general SOPA structure is just focusing on operators, the schools, and the parents and students' rights. I really wanted to isolate this information all by itself because really I think this is the most important part of today's presentation. It's that these obligations on schools have to be done by July 1st, 2021. So when we started looking at SOPA, we were surprised at how much schools have to do. Right now we're a year and a few months out, which should be more than enough time to meet all those obligations. But I think we're gonna to start to see a lot of schools really hit crunch time. And it's gonna to come to a point where you have three months before 
uh, this deadline is in force and you better be ready to go. So we've created a SOPA response team at Tressler. Uh, and one of the things that we've been thinking about is putting together information that allows compliance within a year, year and a half. And we actually think we can get compliance within six months to three months. So anybody that's still on the fence or you have budgetary concerns that don't allow you to get moving on compliance immediately, uh, there'll still be time if you have the right person in the driver's seat with that. So let's talk a little bit more about SOPA. Like we said, it's effective July 1st, 2021. We can't stress that enough. Uh, this deadline has to be the most important aspect of today's presentation and schools are really going to have to look at the ramp up time that they have to implement these uh, these things that allow them to become compliant with SOPA and they'll have to speed that up as they get closer to that deadline. Uh, so that's really um, something that we want to stress and just generally SOPA does replay uh, it, it, it's an amendment to the Student Online Personal Protection Act, which is already in existence, and you know, there's already obligations under that. It's just these amendments or these modifications to the old version of SOPA create so many more obligations on schools, and that's really the importance of, of this new deadline to make sure. And I think the legislature also, when we look back at the legislative history, there was a lot of movement around the date that it should be implemented. And I think the legislature really tried to give enough time because they want compliance. You know, I think as we saw, the legislative intent behind this is to make sure that student data is protected. Really quick too, in case I forget, I, the enforcement of this will be done at this point through the Illinois Attorney General, if there's any violations. So it should not give uh, rise to a private cause of action. But then again, if, if you're not in compliance and there is an incident, uh, that sort of does lay a nice roadmap for a plaintiff's attorney to uh, sue for any damages related to a breach. So while the attorney general is going to be handling the majority of the enforcement, um, compliance should really be, uh, you know, not complying is not a consideration in, in our view. Uh, one of the interesting things that I found from the perspective of somebody who has been practicing in privacy for a long time is the definition of breach and the notification of that incident. And we've had breach notification obligations for a long time through PIPA, which is you know the Personal Information Protection Act, which any data collector in Illinois has responsibilities under that act. But one of the things that we'll see is you need to have uh, different templates, I think, in place to make sure that you're ready to inform and provide proper notification of a breach, which is easier said than done because this breach could also happen at the operator level and might not even happen within the school where you have control of that information. So you're going to need to be able to have a very close, close connection with the operators to make sure that you can get the information that you need in order to provide proper notification to parents and students. Uh, another interesting thing, we talked a little bit about it a second ago, was the, uh, the fact that it provides parent and student rights. So really, when you look at those, that provision, and we will take a closer look at it, that to, for a school district just creates more obligations to make sure that there's some sort of protocol in place to make sure that the parents and students can figure out where their data is going and how it's being used. So once again, uh, from a perspective, all these things have to be done within the next year and a half, which is really gonna put a, an administrative burden and a technical burden on schools. So let's get first into school prohibitions. And I really like this section of, of the statute. It's very simple. There's just two parts to it. And it's just that there's first the financial piece and that's a school simply cannot sell, rent, lease, or trade covered information. So once again, covered information is a defined, is a defined term, what we saw earlier. Um, so it's that PII, the personal information. So a school can't sell, rent, or lease. You can't make money off of this information. And then secondly, the other prohibition is schools cannot share, transfer, disclose, or provide access to students' covered information, which once again, that takes away the, the financial piece. To see if there was a violation of that, of the subpart one, you would just look for money. Did the school make money off of that data? And that's gonna be prohibited. The second one's gonna be, I think, a little bit more difficult for the attorney general's office to enforce. 
because it doesn't have that money component. It just is, did you share or transfer that information? There are some carve outs which make it worthwhile to take a look at, you know, look at the statute more closely. And those carve outs are for if you give that information to law enforcement or things along the, uh, uh, things that, you know, have, that information has to be transferred in some way. So definitely we're taking a look at what the carve outs are. The other interesting thing, and if we had more time, we would definitely get into it, is paragraph two. That's the one that doesn't have that monetary component. Does not apply to non-public schools, which is just a way to say private schools. And I think, you know, sort of thinking about the legislative intent behind that, um, what we see, and we'll look at this a little bit in a, in a few seconds, is you need to put a lot of information up on your website, contracts that you have with vendors, things along that those lines. I think the legislature realized that they're not going to be able to make private schools put that information up, but they do have that control over public schools, perhaps because they're taking public funds. So paragraph two does not apply. Uh, nevertheless, we would recommend that any of our clients, whether they're private schools or public institutions, uh, don't share or transfer information without written agreements in place. And that's the other carve out for that, that second sub part is, you can share and transfer and disclose or provide access to the students covered information, but you need to have written agreements in place and you need to, and generally this would be the overview, you need to have written agreements in place with those vendors so you know how it's going to be protected and you need to have uh, those written agreements posted so parents can look and determine uh, how that information is being used. There's a garbage truck outside. So if you're hearing that, that's just commerce going on basically. So um, this is really the heart of SOPA for schools. And that's section 27 of the statute, uh, which if you want to copy the statute, feel free to reach out to us. I carry them with me. Uh, no matter where I go, I have SOPA statutes, but I could definitely send one to you. Uh, so section 27 deals with school duties. And it says each school must post and maintain on its website. These are these objective obligations that a school will have that they have to comply with. And it's gonna be very easy to see whether or not a school is in compliance because you simply look at the website and see if they've done these things. So that's gonna be the interesting thing, I think, as far as you have this deadline, you have the ramp up time, and compliance is very simple to check. You just go to the school's website. But getting into this, there's a number of items here that a school has to do. And when you look at it, it, it you, it's tough to figure out if this is gonna really be a huge burden on schools or not. I think once the school gets in the routine of collecting this data, storing this data, and then posting this data, it's not gonna be very burdensome at all. But the first couple of steps I think are gonna be a burden. A school will need to put up an explanation of the data elements of covered information that the school collects. That's gonna be, the school has to put up on its website what type of data it's taking on the students. Is it taking names, addresses, academic information? That's gonna to have to be, obviously not the information itself, but the, the data elements. The, this is what we're taking, this is what we're providing to some of the vendors or the ed tech companies. Uh, the school will have to put an explanation of that. Secondly, they will, a school will need a list of operators once again, that term is used to define basically what we're gonna call ed tech companies for today's purposes, at least. So a list of operators that the schools are written agreement with and a copy of each agreement. agreement. So you know, early on, I think we're gonna find a lot of schools, they, they won't even know really which, what agreements they have, what agreements are in force. So that's gonna be a little burdensome, probably something that schools should do anyway to go out and find those schools and start compiling their list. And once again, it needs to be posted on the website or if the school doesn't maintain a website, it needs to be quote, made available for inspection by the general public at its admin office. There are also the third requirement requires for each operator, a list of subcontractors. So that's really one of those obligations that is the school's gonna have to reach out and have a good working relationship with its the uh, ed tech companies to find out who the subcontractors are that's gonna be entrusted with that information. And the fourth is a written description of the procedures that a parent may use to carry out the rights enumerated under section 33. Section 33 you would, you'll see is the parent and student rights section. And so this fourth requirement will make a school set out a protocol 
to be able to answer a, a parent or student's question, if somebody comes into the office and says, how is uh, the data being used? The school's going to be able to uh, say, well, you need to talk to this person and here's how the data is used. So that's another thing that'll have to be done, you know, by July of 2021, so. And I wanted to put this fifth obligation all by itself because it's it's something I haven't seen much of as far as the school will have to list breaches of covered information maintained by the school or breaches under section 15. Section 15 is the obligation on operators to collect data on breaches. So you're going to have to basically air your dirty laundry out here. So if your school was involved in the Pearson breach last summer, that will have to be listed in order to comply with this fifth uh, uh, obligation. So, and you also need a lot of information. I think when we were working uh, with some of our clients on the Pearson student or the Pearson uh, student data breach, it was really tough to get information out of them at times. And you'll need to post the number of students involved in the breach, the date or the date range of the breach and things along those lines. And that's tough to get that information. Um, the number of students, there was always a question as to which students were involved in that breach. And it was tough to get information out of Pearson, at least enough information to satisfy parent and student questions. So these are, if these are uh, protocols that are gonna need to be put in place for if there is a breach that the school is ready to go to really find out how that information was breached and what, what information was involved. Uh, another obligation will be for the school to adopt a policy designating which school employees are authorized to enter into the written agreements, which just administratively is going to make a lot of sense as far as if you're trying to make sure you understand which agreements uh, are still in effect, it's best to have one point person uh, knowing which uh, contracts are still in effect and which ones are coming up, which ones will need to be renewed. Because once again, as we, we said earlier, we need to keep that list going and we need to keep the list updated of all agreements that the school has been involved in. So uh, you're going to have to have that, what I would call a contract point person, I guess, um, know where those contracts are and also be authorized to enter into the written agreement. So you're going to have one person and that person's going to have to know all the information concerning the contracts. Uh, another duty will be that, the, like we, we've we've kind of made reference to this a couple of times already, those written agreements that you have with Pearson or ACT or SAT or any of the other ed tech companies, those are going to need to be posted on the website or made available. So that can also create another administrative headache. Um, once again, I think it makes sense to have that one contract person there, knowing what's going on with all the contracts. This will also need to be updated. So any contracts that are entered into or renewed or modified, those are going to have to go through that one contract point person, as I would call them, and be posted on the website. So this is going to be an ongoing obligation to make sure that you're in compliance. Here's a little more information on the, the responsibilities is if there's a breach. I mean, obviously, I think schools have been aware that if they breach the information of students, they're going to have to get moving on it quickly and remedy that breach or figure out, you know, the best way to address that. This puts a little bit more pressure on a school because it's also a breach at the third party ed tech company. So and you need to be able to provide notification. Uh, to the parents, and it says within 30 calendar days. Easier said than done sometimes. Uh, so what we're really hoping for here is to start to see operators step up and really create a procedure that if they have a breach, they're really putting out information that will allow schools to uh, sort of figure out, be able to post items uh, concerning that breach right away. So there's no lull and then the schools can meet their obligations. Another thing that we're doing for our clients here is creating a template of a notification so that obviously, you know, when we've been involved with a number of breaches or incidents, time is of the essence, as they say. And it's really helpful to have that breach prep in place, such as having templates ready to go, plugging in information, knowing exactly what we should do. So um, 
another obligation on schools there. So this is where we get a little more ambiguous. And I think we really had some real strong objective standards before, but now we start to get into things like each school must implement and maintain reasonable security procedures and practices. And, you know, I think lawyers, they say ambiguity is our friend, but I would rather be able to counsel clients beforehand on SOPA compliance without the ambiguity. As for what reasonable security measures are or procedures are at this time, we, we struggle with this. This is a similar language that's used in PIPA, which is the Personal Information Protection Act. And I think we're ultimately going to get an interpretation of this through the courts. And when that happens, of course, it's gonna be somebody was wrong, you know, in what they did and it wasn't reasonable security uh, procedures. So one of the things that we're doing here, I think is it's more of a technical side of things. I think there's two parts. There's a technical and there's an administrative side to reasonable security procedures. From a technical standpoint, we would refer our clients to a company like Onshore Security to make sure that they're getting you know, a good assessment of where they stand on the technical safeguards that are in place. So that's really something that we would be doing. And as lawyers, uh, I have the, uh, the, I'm able to say, I don't know anything about the tech side of things. So I can push that off to somebody else, which is good. I think the law firms are really gonna have to step in and help on the administrative to make sure that we're giving a proper interpretation of these terms and that the schools are in compliance. So that's why you're gonna want somebody, I think, that's that has some experience in this area from a technical side and from an administrative side. Because this, uh, this obligation even gets further ambiguous so when it says procedures and practices that otherwise meet or exceed industry standards. Once again, I, you know, what are we talking about? Are, are we talking about NIST standards, which are going to be you know, across the board standards? Are we talking about your, the school district next door who perhaps is very highly technical and you know, maybe they're, they exceed far exceed industry standards. So what is gonna be the measuring stick? And we don't have any good answers right now. We just know that if we partner with some tech companies, I think we're gonna have all of our uh, clients compliant with SOPA to the point that it's reasonable. I think, you know, to some degree, if you bury your head in the sand, that's where you're gonna run into trouble. But if you're really taking steps to comply with this, I don't, Think you're going to see the attorney general take a position that you didn't take reasonable steps or or god forbid you see a court down the road so that's where we are with that and it i think onshore could provide a little bit of information on what reasonable security standards are for schools in this area so definitely follow up with them if you have any questions there uh school duties um so here, once again, this is really interesting. And this is something that we've been asking our clients to do for a long time. It says each school may designate an appropriate staff person as a privacy officer. A privacy officer is just such a good idea, not just for schools, but for everybody. So once again, I think that point person that's handling the contracts would be a great privacy officer as well. So that's really where we're putting that. The one person that can answer all the questions. If there's a parent that shows up at the front, office that person knows the answer they know where to get the answer that type of thing the other thing that we're really looking for for a privacy officer to do is implement training of staff or implement training of themselves to keep up on SOPA's requirements and a law firm and obviously uh, a tech company uh, can put those safeguards in and training i think training once again has always been considered a reasonable security or safety practice so if you're showing that you're doing training on a q1 or q2 basis you're gonna really uh, be able to demonstrate that you're putting in those measures that need to be there uh, next another school duty is a school uh, must make a request to an operator that's the ed tech company to delete information that the parent requests. Um, this is a good information, this is a good idea. One of the things that we do with our clients initially is do a data inventory. And when you do a data inventory, you really start to see information that no longer needs to be held and can be dumped. I think information that's sitting around or maybe not being protected, uh, that can become toxic and impose liability. So this is a good situation. Maybe you even have that privacy officer help out with this to make sure that there's a protocol in place 
to say if a parent comes in and they want data uh, removed from Pearson storage or collection or some other ed tech company, that there is a procedure in place to make sure that that happens. Once again, I think we developed this a little bit early on, um, but there's different obligations for private and public schools. And I really wish the statute it was broken up into private school duties and public school duties. I think that would be easier to read. I think overall, at this point, we are just telling our private school clients to comply. It's gonna make parents happier, it's gonna make students happier, and it's just gonna make all information more secure not just for students, but we're also talking about proper uh, storage and collection of employee data as well. That's obviously a good uh, practice to have as well also. So we can maybe get to a couple of questions if I see them here. Uh, we are gonna wrap up at quarter, at quarter two. Uh, so in the next five minutes, I just wanted to talk about, we talked earlier about section 33 in the parent and student rights. And I wanted to make sure that I'm sort of bringing this to everybody's attention as well, uh, because while these are, like I said, parent and student rights, these are obligations that the schools must now fulfill. So this first one here, uh, once again, we have a little ambiguity, I think, in A, K through 12 school purposes. Um, you know, I think we all know what that is. But once again, that's a little more ambiguous than, than what we want, but a student a student's covered information shall be collected only for K through 12 school purposes. So uh, if, if that's not done, that would be uh, the parent or the student's right to say, hey, you know, you need to make sure if you're gonna take our data that it's only being used for certain purposes. And those purposes are what's reflected in subpart B where a student's covered information shall only be adequate, relevant, and limited to what's necessary in relation to the K through 12 school purposes. So once again, a little ambiguous, but I think we know, you know, you can't take more information than what you would need to run the school. So that's where we are with that. Um, and then on C, uh, we're once again creating that protocol. Obviously the legislature was really looking to create a protocol to allow parents and students to have some of that control back, to wrestle some of that control back from the schools uh, of their data. So that's what we see with C there. And then under D, they, the Illinois legislator wanted to make sure that the other statutes that are in place are still being complied with, namely the Illinois School Student Records Act and FERPA, which is the Federal Education Rights and Privacy Act. So you still have to comply with those. So that's going to be important uh, when you're looking at your obligations. Really quick as we wind down, I just wanted to talk a little bit about ob uh, the operator's obligations. And when you look at the, I think a general overview of that, as far as how that plays into school's obligations are, the school still has that fiduciary responsibility. They're the ones that took the information from the student or parent, and they may have given it to a ed tech company or an operator, uh, but the parents don't know that. So if there's an if, if there's an issue with the student's information, they're going to look to the schools. They're not going to really care who the operator was. That was one of the things I think we saw with the Pearson breach earlier this summer was that uh, nobody knew who Pearson was. They didn't know that Pearson had the information. That that with this um, statute in place. That should not happen as far as the parents will have access to the contracts and all the agreements, they'll be posted. And there should be a point person there that we talked about. So we should see uh, immediate uh, rewards from this if there is a, another incident involving this information. So, um, and I think we covered everything there as far as you're gonna see the schools really taking the heat on any incident. So a um, little information on our SOPA response team there. And I did see two questions. I'm gonna pull it down here. Oh, I don't have a mouse, so I'll go this way. There we go. All right, if you don't mind, uh, do a couple. So we have a question here that says, the data about most used applications from 2017 to 2018, has there been any shifts since then? That data about most used applications, 
Uh, so has there, I think what you're getting at, so it says that data about most used applications from 2017, 2018, has there been any shifts since then? I think it, that's asking as far as, has there been any new applications, new apps, new, yes, I think that changes probably all the time. I mean, just from my own experience, watching my high school age kids and junior high kids uh, work on their Chromebooks, I'm seeing, uh, I was shocked. I saw a advertisement when my kid was doing flashcards uh, on an application. An advertisement, I think it was for a political campaign. So I think this is always changing and I think that we're seeing as more technology seeps into our students' lives, we're seeing more data being stored elsewhere. So yes, I think you've seen um, information and if i'm not answering your question please feel free to catch up with me anytime but i think we're seeing huge jumps in the technology and the and now we're going to see changes in the regulations as well and this is and we're seeing you know one thing is the threats we're seeing and you know from hackers and that type of thing so everything's evolving quickly and so i think this will be good to get that information posted for parents to look at Second question is, is, will there be a recording of this that could be watched at a later time? Yes, there will. What a great question. So that's exactly, I think, where we wanted to end. There will be a recording of this, and we're going to put it on Onshore's website, and we'll send a follow-up email. Oh, and we're going to send a follow-up email. Yeah. So, and if you need the slides or anything, you can reach out to Onshore or myself. Um, I would, And if you want to talk more about SOPA, I can talk for hours still, and Josh can talk for hours. We'd love to chat about it. So with that, um, oh, we have another question. Uh, what is the school's liability following a school data breach? How should this be dealt with in the contract between the school and ed tech vendor? Yeah, that's a great question. So the first question is, is what is the school's liability? We anticipate we're going to see plaintiff's attorneys step in and, you know, initiate lawsuits like we have in everything as far as BIPA or PIPA. Even though the attorney general is really on the enforcement side of things, you're still going to see schools uh, take the brunt of it, I think, if there is a breach. So school's liability after a breach, you were entrusted with the information and there's going to be allegations that you negligently stored or collected that information or you negligently entrusted a third party with that information so the liability is going to be there and how should this be dealt with in the contract between the school and the edtech vendor it's really tough I, I think we run into a lot of problems where it's a lot of boilerplate type contracts and we would love to revise that language but it seems like a lot of those vendors say take this language indemnity language or whatever or don't enter into the contract. So it's a constant problem for us. We would love to revise those contracts the best we could, but really it's a constant problem. The best thing that we've been doing for our clients right now with those contracts is just making them aware. Here's the indemnity provision. Here's what the obligation that you're going to have. You couldn't shift that liability. You might even see some contracts from some of these uh, vendors that say, if we breach, you're still on the hook for it. So now whether that's enforceable or not, I think that's a, a completely different question, but that language is boilerplate and we really have trouble uh, revising that language. What should we do first to make progress towards being compliant and how can you help with that? Yes, what a great question. So um, one of the things we do is we have broken this down from an administrative standpoint to make sure we have the forms, we're gathering the information. I can tell you the first step that we take is to do an inventory to see what information you have that would fall under SOPA. That's the first step. So uh, we've been working in this area now for you know a while with SOPA. So uh, we have a lot of steps and we're ready to go on that. We have the SOPA response team and we're working with great vendors like Onshore to make sure that we're able to bring everybody in compliance with SOPA by that deadline. And obviously that's how we can help. As far as if you give us a call, we have um, education lawyers on hand, we have contract attorneys, I'm a privacy attorney. And so we think we've brought all those pieces together to really get um, some good information on SOPA compliance well before the deadline. And I think, is that the last question? Yeah, I can't quite scroll down. Let's see. I'm having some trouble. No, I think that's, is that the last? Yeah. I think, 
Just scroll it. Do two fingers on the trackpad and scroll. Let's see. There we go. Old style. Okay. What are the ramifications of not being in compliance by July 21st? Well, first off, it's very objective criteria that you're going to see. It won't be posted on the website, on the school's website, so you can see that there's not compliance there. It'll be interesting to see how the Illinois Attorney General uh, approaches enforcement. I think, you know, I, I wouldn't risk it. Um, maybe there'll be a little leeway given for some school districts or some circumstances, I'm not sure. But um, that's gonna be one of the issues. And I think the, another value added piece to having legal counsel on this is to be able to hopefully, when you're working on these documents, maybe a lot of that information will be attorney client privilege as well. And so we can protect that stuff too, because the last thing we wanna do, and this is one of the issues that we've run into with other privacy um, incidents, is the last thing you wanna do is create a checklist for a plaintiff's attorney to look at and say, did you do this? So now you have your checklist and for whatever reasons, financial constraints or time constraints, let's say you didn't do that thing. Now you have a list of items that you didn't do. So that's one of the things that we would like to do is get in there and sort of protect that as well. Um, and it's the same question twice. What are the ramifications of not being in compliance? So with that, I think we have the questions. We have a few minutes. Feel free to follow up with any of us. Um, we, we love talking SOPA and we really appreciate your time this morning.